Hi, John here. Let's talk about this system called Doxygen. What is it? Why do we use it? What's it for? Well, this thing is a thing that generates documentation from source code uh, in various programming languages. As so they lift your C, Objective C, C Sharp, PHP, Java, Python, IDL, uh, various types of IDLs, right? Fortran, VHDL, and the language D, and, and some other stuff, right? Now, it's based on something that was uh, released about uh, 25 years ago that came with Java that was called Java Doc. And the idea was the, uh, the application opens up and reads all your source code and it can generate a model of your source code and tell you about things like, you know, which functions call other functions and, 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 and uh, identify all of the parameters of each pro uh, um, method of every object and create all these indices so you can find things in a nice document. And I'm sure you've seen these on the internet if you've ever looked, uh, you know, done a Google search on, you know, how do I call some subroutine in some library? Uh, at least 50-50 you know, odds that you run into something that was a, a, a web page that was created from Doxygen, all right? So let's talk about how to use that. This is just an introduction. We're going to talk about the basics. Regardless of how long I might talk, trust me, there's a lot more this can do than what I know how to do and what I'm going to talk about in here, all right? So this is the website for Doxygen. And, you know, here's the license and the usual stuff, okay? Now, if you go to documentation of Doxygen and you open up its manual, it tells you all about how to do all this stuff, how to install it, you know, the basics, you know, documenting the code is basically all I'm really going to talk about in here. The, again, you saw all those other bullets. There's a lot this could do beyond what I'm going to get into here. The idea is that you have specialized comment blocks, okay? And in those specialized comment blocks, you can put uh, little commands and markers. Now, the way it works is I use the Java doc style, first of all. So that means that my doc box is always going to start with a slash star star. That's a command to Doxygen. Then I treat the rest of it like a regular old doc box. Now, I usually put a long list of asterisks on the bottom just so it stands out when I'm looking at my source code and doesn't just get lost in the visual noise, okay? You can also use slash star bang and some other techniques. Whether or not you put an asterisk on every single line or not is up to you. I put them on all the lines because, again, it makes it stand out in the code a little bit better. This is not too bad of a way to do it either. Uh, you know, you can also put long lines or a bang in there. There's a special mode in Doxygen that allows you to um, enable the use of the long asterisk line on the top. And it says down here, you know, you have to change this setting down here. And you know, I'd, I'd like to use the defaults to whatever extent that I can, all right? So we're gonna use this top one up here, which is a reminiscent of the early 25-year-old uh, you know, Doc comment style, and that's how Java Doc works. You, your doc box is like this. Now, after this, the document goes on to say, oh, look, when you do this, you can put things like at param in the, again, specialized doc box in, uh, to use this to document what the point is of a parameter named theory in this function, right? This guy here called theory. The documentation for that argument is right here, okay? So you'll see at param for each one of the arguments or parameters in in your various functions, okay? Uh, what have we got down here? Another example, Java doc banner. What's going on here? A brief thingy and then a blah, 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 blah. Now, um, we'll see what this is getting on about when we look at some actual code. When you see what the, uh, the documentation that comes out of this looks like, uh, the point is that the first line of text in here it has a significant and different meaning than the rest of the lines down here. And I've got some line wrap going on there. There you go. That's easier to read now, right? So the notion of uh, the word brief up here refers to a comment that will appear in a part of the generated documentation from Doxygen where brief statements go, all right? So this will be more meaningful as we look at some uh, um, uh, programs and the generated documentation and walk through all this, all right? And it says you can do it like this, that, or the other thing, okay? So many options, many variations of options, a lot of documentation, all right? So this thing does a lot of stuff if you let it, okay? So I'm going to close this right now. We'll go back to the uh, 
to the basic code here. Here's an old assignment that I've been tinkering around with this morning. Let's look at what happens if I run this thing through Doxygen. Let's not look at the code at all right now. Let's just use Doxygen. So if you read all the doc, you'll find out. You can also just read the man page, okay? Uh, you basically need to run it in one of two ways, all right? You need to create this thing called a template, uh, or rather a configuration file, all right? And it has a template one that it'll give to you, okay? Which makes your life a lot easier, and it fills it in with all the default values. Super cool. Thank you very much. And the way you do it is you say Doxygen, and you put a minus G, all right? Remember, everything in square brackets is optional, and the default for the file name that you're going to store the, 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 the configuration into is a, is a file named doxy file. In minus S over here, this optional parameter says suppress uh, documentation details in the config file. And we'll see what that's all about in a second, right? So if I say doxygen minus, uh, what was it, G for generate, okay? It says, okay, I just created a, a thing called doxy file. If I want to use it, I well, would edit it and tweak it as I see fit. And then I can run doxygen space doxy file or just run doxygen on its own because the default that it will use for its configuration data is called doxy file. So if I type ls, and I like this better, you can see the doxy file that it created right there. All right, so let's have a look, see what's in there real quick before we use it. It says, hi, I'm created by 18.17 and blah, 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 blah. Now, all these blue lines, these are all comments, okay? This is what are removed if I said doxy file minus S minus G, okay? I left the comments in because sometimes I don't remember what all these mean. And if you look at it, this has got a lot of crud in here, okay? <laughs> no, we're not going to go over every one of these um, uh, configuration <laughs> details. I'm going to talk about 10 of them, okay? I use the default, and then I tweak about 10 of them. And you can play around with these more to your heart's content. So let's just look at the very first one here. This one you probably want to change no matter what. Well, what is this thing? Project name. It's a single tag word or a sequence of words, yada, yada, yada. This shows up in your generated output. So let's change this. Well, let's leave it alone entirely. All right, we'll change it and then we'll run it again. So if I type Doxygen, at this point, all the defaults, what's it going to do? It's going to open up this file and do what it says. All right, let's just see what happens. So it prints out a lot of stuff in here. Uh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, blah, 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 blah. Okay, whoa, look at all what's going on there. Okay, it created two subdirectories. One's called HTML and one's called LaTeX, or technically that's pronounced LaTeX, I believe. Uh, this is used if you want to create a PDF file. I generally don't use that, uh, and I generally turn it off in the doxy file because that just wastes disk space and time if you're not ultimately going to use it. There's another directory here called HTML, and if you type ls on that directory, you'll see a whole bunch of files in here. This is what Doxygen created for me, okay? Uh, one of which is going to be called index.html, okay? So let's open up that index.html file and see what it did, all right? There you go. It says, my project. This is the thing that I decided not to rename, okay? So I'm going to rename that to something a little more useful, okay? So this is the main page. There's no project-wide documentation written. All I did is I just ran this on some code so far, all right? Now, it turns out I did put some documentation in the code because, you know, I try to be a good programmer. But as we'll see, I woefully <laughs> fell woefully short of documenting everything. So let's look and see what Doxygen then does. There's a thing called classes in here. All right, show me all the classes. Now, this particular project has three C++ classes that are created. All right, one of them's called memory, one's called register file, one's called RV32I, okay? Now, the short of it is this project is a simulator of a CPU, and it is called RISC-V 32-bit in integer mode only. All right, so RV32I is the name of the type of machine this thing simulates. So I would like to rename my project RV32I at some point, and we'll see that as we go. So these three objects, what do they do? Well, the RV32I class represents a CPU that can execute or, you know, simulate instructions. 
register file is a class that holds all the registers for that simulated CPU, and memory is a class that represents the simulated memory of that CPU, all right? Now, let's look and see what Doxygen does by default. Let's open up this memory class. Now, I went through and put a lot of documentation in my memory class. Let's have a look-see at that really quick so we get kind of a bearings on what we're doing here. Well, let's look at the C++ uh, uh, plus plus part of this thing first. This thing here are the usual undocumented <laughs> functions that you might do when you're hacking together a quick project, okay? The whole file is full of stuff like that, all right? Now, let's look at the header file for this. And the, you'll see that my documentation is in the header file. If I put documentation in the CPP file, what I'm doing is I'm putting Docugen for the a programmer in there, right? If I did something screwy in there, the code-wise, I'm documenting the code or the implementation of what's going on. In the header file, this is the documentation for somebody that wants to use this class, right? We're dealing with about two different people. You're talking about people that want to edit and maintain this memory class. And we're talking about a person that might say, I want to use this memory class in my program, but I don't care about the insides of it. All right. So this is kind of a subtle thing that we'll see that we can adjust Doxygen to make, uh, make things easier or worse depending on the type of person that we're, we're, uh, we're, we're writing the doc for. Okay. So what are we really looking at here? Remember these special slash star star things are actual commands to Doxygen. So if we look at the documentation for this memory class, we'll see that the class itself has documentation that says uh, a simulated memory of bytes whose starting address is zero. So if we go back to here, this is the, remember this is the documentation for the class called memory. We went into classes and we clicked on memory and this is what we see. So if we scroll around in here, there's a detailed description of the class. It's a simulated memory of bytes whose starting address is zero. All right? Up here, there's an index of all the public member functions. These are the things that a person who wants to use this class cares about. If you're using this class, you probably don't care about all the private variables and all this other stuff, right? You only care about the public things that you can interact with and you want to know what those things do. So look what we got in here. We got a constructor, a destructor, we got a, a, some function called check address that says check if the address is legal, size, get the number of bytes in the simulated memory. These are the kind of things that you might need to do if you have a, you know, a, a class that represents memory of a of a simulated machine. Get 8, get 16, get 32. What are these doing? These are getting, you, you know, if you want to say, hey, I want to get some data out of this simulated memory, I need to be able to have a get routine to do that. In terms, of, there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of different ways to get data in different formats. The specifics of what it means to have a sign extended value versus an, it doesn't really matter, okay? Or big Indian, little, that's specific to this project. This discussion right now is based on Doxygen and what does it mean? How do I document all these things, right? Let's not worry about what somebody does with this specific example code, all right? Well, what do we got here? We've got these get routines accessors, right? Then we have a bunch of set routines. These are mutators, okay? And then we have some utility functions like dump. Well, you know, if you're creating a machine, it'd be nice to be able to dump out the contents of memory in the usual and canonical form, which is a hex dump with, you know, the ASCII stuff off onto the right. How does data get into the memory in the first place? Well, there's a thing called load file, right? Now, remember, we're simulating a CPU. So what, what this really does, the, the project as a whole, what it does is it says, we'll open this file in binary, copy the contents of that file into the simulated memory, and then pretend that that's a, you know, a machine instructions for this specific type of CPU and simulate their execution. So this function here is what we call to load that in when you give it the file name, all right? Set lock below is a little utility function that I added to my memory uh, simulator that's, uh, that I can use to make sure that uh, once I've read in a file, 
I can lock the memory so that when that program is running, it can't actually destroy itself. It helps me debug what's going on. So this is a you know application specific uh, concern. All right, not so much for the uh, doxygen discussion, but just so you have a you know kind of get your bearings of what's going on. All right, so there's an index of all these uh, uh, accessors and mutators and stuff like that. Now there's detailed documentation for each one of them. If you go up here and click on, you know, the constructor, it will link you down, uh, warp you down here, and look what we got. It's a memory constructor, and it takes this S. The parameter S is the number of bytes used to create uh, the in the simulated memory. Maybe I could have phrased that a little bit better, but, you know, so this is, you know, how big is the memory supposed to be, right? Now this is an unsigned 32-bit integer, which means that the most memory this thing can simulate is obviously 4 gigs, because that's, you know... 32 one bits all in a row, right? F, 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 F is, uh, uh, what did I say? <laughs> it's a 32 bit integer, that's four gigabytes, okay? Rounding off, roughly speaking. Now I put a note in here. See this bar over here? We'll see how this was done in order for it to show up this way. It says, look, the value S will be rounded up to the next multiple of 16. The valid address range of the simula uh, simulated memory bytes will be that of the half open interval from zero, including zero, up to and not including S. All right. So, if I, in other words, if I said create a memory, a simulated memory with 100 bytes in it, the valid memory address will be from zero to 99. All right. Remember this from like, you know, junior high school math. Square bracket is inclusive, and the parenthesis means exclusive of these two end values, all right? Here's my destructor and some documentation of the destructor. There's usually not that much to say for a de uh, destructor, if anything all. Here's the documentation for check address. Just check, make sure that the address is legal, and it has a parameter called ADDR. Well, this is the address to check, and it says it returns what? It'll return a true if the address is an address that is valid and present, slash present in the simulated memory okay otherwise what it would return false right so if i created a simulated memory with 100 bytes in it and i allow somebody to access it using a 32-bit value well they could ask me for the value at byte number 200 right well that's not in there and that's a problem so this thing provides me with a way to first say, hey, is this address in there, right? And it returns a true and a false. Again, specific to why this class exists in the first place. Here's a dump routine in the comment for this thing. Print this thing of the entire simulated memory contents. Warning, this thing will only work if when the uh, size of the um, memory is a multiple of 16. And there's a typo in here with a hash in front of it. Sorry about that. I'll obviously have to go fix my, my, uh, my program later. But, uh, uh, okay, so you're seeing various things as warning. You saw a note up here. You can actually have a bug and report bugs and stuff like that. So what you've got here is Doxygen's creating all the stuff that's in blue here. And then my doc boxes provide the contents for all of these things, all right? So let's go back and look at my code again. Look what's going on in here. So the constructor here takes a parameter called S. And here's what the documentation looks like. It says, okay, pram, at pram, that's a command. You can't change this and say arg or something like that. No, this is a, con this is a command that oxygen. And S has to match this thing down here. So what, what, what I'm saying, here's the number of bytes to create in the simulated memory. If we go back to our web page, scroll back up to the top and click on here, that's what shows up right there. Okay, so it creates a printier version than uh, this thing, okay? Note, here's where the contents of that note show up, right? The value will be rounded up, right? Here, the value will be rounded up. There's another note down here. This thing is the, you know, this half open interval, right? Well, that's the second note. So what does that mean? It means it's going to coalesce all the notes together and put it in a note grouping, all right? Which is this thing with the bar on it over there, all right? Now, let's say, remember I was talking about this brief stuff? These thingies up here are the brief descriptions of these functions. If you click more here or this, you end up in the same place, like get size, all right? This is then the, de the detailed description of what this member function does, okay? So let's go back to the source code. What's going on here? How come the constructor didn't have a brief description? All right, back to the top. There's no brief description of either of these two. Why? 
okay? Well, look at how I, I, I commented this thing. Well, I have to, oops, it looks like I'm in view. I got to take Vi. If we come down here and I say brief, or if you read the uh, Doxygen uh, documentation, I can either say like at brief, and I'll just say A, B, C, D, E here so we know it stands out. I can do that which tells Doxygen that this is the brief comment for this function, right? And then I can rerun Doxygen again. And it'll rerun it. I can reload my web page, go back to the top. And now there's my brief discussion there, right? If I click on memory, it repeats that brief discussion down here. Now, that's an op option in Doxygen, whether you want it to repeat that brief thing or not. I... By default, apparently, it's set to yes, I want that. And in my code, I usually set it to true as well, okay, as I take advantage of that. So if you want things to show up in here, my point is you have to tell Doxygen, this is the brief comment, and then maybe you go down here, and uh, there might be more detailed comments, all right? So let's back up here. All right, so that's kind of what's going on here. Now, the destructor here has no brief description. I could make this. A brief description like that okay if I wanted to now it will show up in the brief part okay and where are we at go back to the top of the web page now both the constructor and the destructor have brief comments and the brief comments are repeated down here in the details section all right so now we're making some progress all right so there's our constructor we know how to do notes and parameters and we can see how they show up and constructors and destructors are sort of special case right they don't actually have a return value <laughs> among other things right so let's look at some regular old member functions all right here's something that has a brief description that says check if our address is legal right uh the parameter adder is the address that we want to check we just saw this a second ago we're looking at the doc and now i got an at return it's true if the address is an address that is valid slash present we just saw that right and and this thing returns a boolean now notice in here i don't say it's returning a boolean in my doc it's a waste of my time why because an idiot can see it returns a boolean and oxygen can be an idiot among other things and read this in fetch it out of here for me don't waste your time and everyone else's by saying this returns an int okay <laughs> i've had a number of students do things like that and it's like yeah thank you tell me something i don't know the whole purpose of documentation is to fill in the gaps with things that people don't know, right? So let's look at the detail again of check address. It knows what it is, and it prints it all out, so you don't have to return, uh, 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 repeat that, okay? Um, again, we get the, the parameters because I said at param for adder and so on, okay? So you can sort of see the relationship in here. Uh, get size, right? Here's the brief description. It has a return. It doesn't have any arguments, so you don't document any. If the return is void, don't document a return. Don't say the return is void, right? Again, it knows, okay? <laughs> Anybody who's reading this is a programmer, and they know how to look over here and see that it's an unsigned 8-bit integer or whatever. Don't document the types, okay? Doxygen does this for us. Now it gets a little bit more interesting. I have this get 8, get 16, get 32. And I'm lazy. I'm a programmer. I don't want to repeat, you know, this whole doc box every time for each of these three things. The only difference of these are how much memory I go get and return. I want an 8-bit value, a 16-bit value, or a 32-bit value. All right? It just so happens that this simulated machine runs in little Endian mode. If you know what that is, if you don't, it doesn't really matter for this conversation. Okay? So what does this really how does this really work then? See this def group? I'm saying, look, I'm going to document all these at once. I don't want to really have to type this crap in three times. You can knock yourself out if that's what you want to do. But if you then go back and need to modify one, this is why we write subroutines for crying out loud. This is basically a comment subroutine. So I can not have to edit or create many things that all say the same thing. 
All right, this is generic for all three, and anything specific on these three can go over here. So let's see how this works. I'm going to define a grouping. I name the group. All right, now after here, this part over here, as you'll see, this is like a, a, a heading that will go on the web page that defines this group or discusses this group. Okay, so the documentation for every one of these functions that this uh, group represents is it's going to say i look this these fun this function any one of them will read and return a little endian value from memory okay now you might argue uh when i'm returning a single byte what does that mean for little endian but that doesn't matter right i mean logically it doesn't matter if it's big endian or little endian okay it will function in the same way but in order to be able to reuse this documentation is my point you need to write something that is correct and true in the context of all three of these functions. You can't just put unrelated things in a group and expect them to make any sense is my point, right? Now, since every one of them has a single parameter called adder, I document that right here. This is the address of the first of potentially a plurality of bytes that might be fetched from the memory in order to construct the value that's returned, that kind of a thing, right? Well, what does this thing return? Well, it's the value of the little Indian value that came out of the memory that's starting at the given address, right? Uh, and then I got to note, if one or more of the requested bytes are not in the simulated memory address uh, range, then a uh, warning message will be printed on uh, standard out, Okay. That's just how this thing works. It's part of the requirements. Now, what makes it a group is this thing right here. At open curly, and then down to this at close curly down here in, in you know, in a, in a doxygen comment block. Ensconces this group of these three things. So it says, take this group, put all the things between this and this in the group, and apply the same comments for all of them, so I don't have to repeat it, okay? Now, what's over here? Well, these, you'll see in a minute, these are the brief uh, definitions, these are the brief description of each one of these individual functions. So now I can put a brief description on here that applies only to get eight and say this gets an 8-bit value from there. And then for this one, it'll say this gets a 16-bit value, a little Indian value, yada, yada, yada. Here's the, th the brief description for this one, all right? So let's go see what happens, how this works, all right? So if we go back to the top of this file here, look, get 8, get 16, and get 32. These are our grouping. Right now, remember I said those these 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 triple slash comments over here, and the less than is part of it. This whole thing to doxygen means this comment here applies to the thing on the left of this block of this comment marker here. Right, this whole thing here means make this the brief definition of the thing that's on the left, which is of course get eight. All right. So let's look and see what happens over there. That's how this got here, all right? If I click on Get 8, now what happens? Well, I opened up a whole new web page. This is the web page for that group, okay? What's up here on the top? It says, read and return a little Indian value from memory. Let's go back to our code. That's this right here, all right? The get little Indian thingy up here, that's what caused this thing to stay that up there. It's like the title up there, right? So here's my three functions repeated like you saw on the other page. This whole page is this group. Okay, here's the comment for the group as a whole. The brief guys are repeated in here. And there's a detailed description, the parameters, the adder, each one of them has an adder. What is it for? That's this thing. What does it return? Blah, 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 blah. What's the note down here? Okay, so that's how all this got created from this comment box here. All right, in the individual Brief descriptions came out of here, right? So here's another grouping, right? So have the, the gets and then the get with SX means sign extended, right? Don't worry about if you don't know what sign extended means. It's just another accessor, and there's three of them, okay? And again, there's a group and uh, common documentation for each one. Here's the beginning and the ending that says all these functions are in that group, okay? So you're going to see the exact same kind of thing, that we see in here that vary between get eight versus get eight SX, all right? And the same kind of a thing happens again, right? So the only real difference between the these two functions is one is sign extended and one is not.
If you don't know what that means, it doesn't really matter. Just put it in your head that the the uh, the two have um, uh, the two different variants are uh, uh, have to do with a different kind of value comes out of memory. Okay. All right. So let's notice that the get eight and get sixteen don't show up down here, but get thirty two does. Okay, so what, what's going on here? Well, all three of them have their documentation right here. And this note applies to all three. But GET32 has an additional note that's only applicable to GET32. Why and how did that happen? Well, down here, look at how this is commented differently. Okay, well, first of all, I forgot to mention... Notice that this comment applies to the thing on the left of the comment itself, which is this guy down there, right? Let's go down here and look and see what's going on over here. Well, these lines are really long. In fact, the implementation of this function is inlined right here. There's too much in here. I didn't want to put this comment way over there. So I put the comment on top of the function instead of underneath it. So what does that do? Well, notice there's no less than sign here. That means that this comment applies to the thing that follows the comment. All right, instead of the thing that preceded it. So the triple X comment with one line on here is the brief comment for the thing that follows it, which is get SX8. And that's what you see in the in the, in the uh, in the Doxygen page. Same thing for get 16, but get 32 has two things in it over here. All right. Because it has two things, it has to be told which part of it is the brief, which part of it is something else, like a note. All right? So that's why this note here is different for GET32. Or let's say we say it's different and that GET32 appears here in the document uh, period, and it has a note for it that's not present for the other ones. Now, why is this unique and separate and different? Well, if you know what uh, sign extension means and the memory holds a 32-bit value, and you sign extend it to a 32-bit value, you've effectively accomplished nothing whatsoever, okay? So this function is superfluous. <laughs> and, and the note here is that I only put it in there for consistency, all right? Because I wanted to, you know, I have a get eight sign extended, a 16-bit sign extended, I might as well have a 32 sign extended, even though the operation of, of sign extending this is effectively like multiplying a number by one. Okay, you can do it, and it means something, but it effectively doesn't change its value. All right, so I did this for consistency, so that I have a function that you know sim lexicographically matches these other ones. So when you're writing code, your intention uh, can be indicated differently than it would be if you used uh, uh, this uh, function versus some other way of reading the memory, all right? Okay, um, the point in this diagram, in this discussion is that if you want to have a, a note on one of these that's in a group, there's how you do it, okay? And if you put a note in here, you then have to tell it what to do with this other part there, okay? That's, that's the whole purpose here of bringing it up in this contract. Here's another grouping, all right? Shared comments for the three set routines. Here's the brief descriptions for each of these three set routines. We go up here and we look at those set routines, right? Remember, we're looking at the gets, the get SXs, and the uh, now we have the sets, right? Set 8, 16, and 32. Let's click on this. Well, here's the grouping of all the doc for these three guys, just like the other one, okay? Uh, what's up down here? Here's the documentation for this dump routine that dumps out all my stuff and hacks it again. There's now we have a warning. Okay. It might even be a bug. And here's the error that I, for putting that hash in front of size right now, it turns out that in Doxygen, in some contexts, where's the, oh, I'm looking for the dump routine. Uh, these are assimilated. Okay, blah blah blah. In the warning, in this thing here, uh, what in 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 Dodge, sometimes you can put a hash in front of a word, and that when that word refers to a like a private member variable or something like that, or just you know a member variable in the class, and what it will do is it'll make this clickable, 
and then you can then go see the doc for that thing. You know, you know, be blue, so you know it means something other than uh, just uh, the word in English, right? Now, the reason that there's a hash here is because when I configured Doxygen uh, to do this, as you saw, these are the default settings. Now, the default settings in Doxygen are kind of designed to generate documentation. Remember, I said there's two classes of people we want to address when we're writing documentation. A person that wants to use code as a library and doesn't care about what's inside it. And the person that needs to develop and maintain that library who does care what's inside it. My point being that size, if we scroll down a little bit further, is a private member variable in this class. People that just want to use the class don't care about all this private junk down here. So right now, Doxygen is set so that it's not documenting. It doesn't reveal to the user this variable called size. So when I wrote these comments, I expected Doxygen to be tweaked and not running in the default form. So I'm going to leave the hash in there for now, okay? So it turns out that I actually misspoke earlier. It's hard to think while you're lecturing at the same time. This is not a typo error, all right? This will turn into a link to the member variable documentation for this uh, private uh, member variable <laughs> if, if Doxygen <laughs> is told to generate doc for that variable, right? So this was written for me as a developer, not uh, to be presented to a user, okay? So it didn't know what to do with it, so it just left the hashtag on there, right? And as we saw, there's another one uh, down here as well. So this could turn into a mess if it's not run through Doxygen correctly, right? <laughs> a little takeaway there, right? Anyway, this should be understandable at this point. You got a brief description as well as a warning, and you can clearly see that in here. And we'll tweak Doxygen, and that'll turn into a link in a minute. Uh, what comes next in here? The load file. There's the brief. Uh, here is a description. All right. So this one is a little different than what we've seen so far. Uh, most of them only have brief descriptions and then no detailed discussion, which is down here. Now, these are all kind of smashed together. You can put blank lines in there, and then it'll separate. Doxygen makes paragraphs. If you want multiple paragraphs, you just keep on going. Uh, and if you read the documentation, you can find out that uh, it will recognize uh, the full markdown uh, language in here, and you can put headings and all kinds of stuff in here, okay? I'm not going to get into that. You can read the doc and find out what to do beyond just getting it to go, all right? That's my goal right now. Just get it to work, okay? So we got a parameter in here that describe what this is, the name of the file that we want to open and read. Remember, this is the load file uh, member function, all right? It returns a true if the thing was opened and read in the simulation memory. If everything went well, it returns true. And it returns false if the thing could not be opened or the size is bigger than uh, than the simulated memory, right? If it doesn't fit, it's an error, okay? Uh, we go back to our documentation for the load file, which is sitting right here. And what do we see? Well, there's the brief repeated in the discussion of this member. And then there's the detailed description here, parameter details. And notice I have two separate return uh, descriptions. I document both true and false rather than just true like I did in one of the other functions, okay? So here's the documentation for lock below. We have a brief thing. We have a detailed paragraph in here. We document the parameter I. I probably should have called this adder to make it more useful and meaningful. If I go back and tweak this code, I should do that. This is just probably not a good name. This is not a really good way to do this. And then we've got our private member variables down here, uh, mem, size, and lock below. Again, these one-line brief descriptions of these uh, three uh, variables down here. Again, the, the, the less than sign says this applies to the thing on the left. You've got a lot of right about it. You want to have a brief and a detailed description. You could have a full-blown doc box full of tons of stuff above 
this as well if you wanted to. And Doxygen would put all that in there and format it all for you, okay? So this is how you want to document a class. This is a proper way to do this, all right? You've got detailed and you've got summary. You document every single parameter. You talk about the fact that uh, the range of addresses, what does it mean, right? Tell me what I don't know. All right, that's that's what documentation's for. If you create a class in your program, why is it there? What's it supposed to do? What's it for? Now you might argue, oh, this class name is so self-documenting that anyone would understand what it is. I can assure you that's not true in all cases, and only the most trivial applications is this true. All right, this is ten tons of overkill for a trivial application like this, whose most of their functions are one line of code like that. All right, I could read this line of code and have no problem understanding what it means, okay? But once this turns into a piece of a 300,000 line application, I don't want to have to go through 300,000 lines of code and figure out what everything means, okay? So this is a big gratuitous on a small application, but you need to learn how to do this so that you have done it when you get to a big application. Okay, let's now look at some of the values in this doxy file, config file, that are not set to the defaults. All right. Uh, first, let's have a look see up here under files. Look what we got here these header files. Now, notice that it says here's a list of all documented files with brief descriptions. This suggests that a file itself can have a brief description which you should put in your header files. Why is it there? Why is the stuff inside this file not in this file over here? All right? You need to explain this sort of thing because people aren't going to know. I mean, surely we've all tried to download code off the Internet and then use it and find out, oh, I'm supposed to do this, and uh, in order to use this function here, I need to figure out how to call it. And then we go in there and we look at the documentation and it's crap, okay? For example... I did not document uh, hardly anything in this class, simply because I just threw it together really quickly. Uh, if we look at this thing, uh, there's no doc at all. <laughs> it just simply says, here's a class that's got some member functions. Good luck understanding what they do. All right, so this is a total jerk move. All right. Now, I wrote this for myself, and the reason that this exists, I mean, you know, I'm a teacher. I wrote this so that I could use it to verify that the assignment makes sense, that it's doable, and generate the correct output, all right? And I was lazy and didn't bother commenting <laughs> the vast majority of this code, okay? And I also, let's look at another thing in here, documented it in the wrong place, all right? I was kind of lazy. Historically, I used to write code very differently than I do today. I mean, I've been doing this for 40 years. Uh, old habits are hard to break. Let's look very closely at what we've been just looking at. Notice all the comments are in this header file. They're not in the CPP file. Oops, that's a different one. Oops, that one is too. Again, hard to talk and type at the same time. There's no comments for this constructor. There's no comments for check address. What's in here are comments to the person that needs to edit this code, which have nothing to do with the comments that we show people that might want to call this function. Does that person really need to know the way I rounded this thing up to the next multiple of 16? No, they do not. They simply need to know that it does round it up to the next multiple of 16. And I threw that comment in there because, uh, you know, this is for students, undergraduate students, and they may not recognize what, what's going on with that and mask, right? Oops, let's go ahead and open that back up. Right? So this is, in other words, this is the code that does the rounding, if you can't recognize that, right? Okay, so that's the kind of comments that go in those files. Now, what, what's my point? Well, if we look at this file, there are a lot of empty doc boxes in here, and some of them are actually filled in. If we actually, well, here we go. Here's one that's actually filled in. Disassemble the given instruction word, okay? This documentation should be in the header file, not in the CPP file, okay? Now, why is that true? Well, the reason it's true is because if I was to make this into a commercial product and sell it to somebody, 
and I wanted them to be able to write code that uses the 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 member functions my memory my memory member functions though certainly the ones that are not inlined right are in this cpp file well this cpp file is the thing i don't want the uh the customer to see it's my proprietary secret stuff right well when you buy a library you get you know the library file big archive or a bunch of dot o object modules right as we say object code only but in order to use that object code, you still need the header file that goes along with it. And you need the documentation so you know what to do, all right? So it only makes sense that the documentation should be in this header file because that's the only thing, it's the only source code that you would sell if this was a commercial product to a customer. You're going to give them the doc, and you're going to say, hey, you can call this, and here's the data types, but I'm not going to give you anything else. My secret sauce is in how this has been implemented, all right? That's why the doc should go in the header files. Now, like I said, uh, many, many, many years ago, <laughs> when I first started doing my coding, I, I honestly find it much more convenient to put my doc in right next to the uh, C++ code because, you know, I kind of make it up as I go. If you're just tinkering with code, the reality is you're changing things. You might add an argument or something like that. You might just hack this thing up. You have to then go back and hack it up in the header file to match. Right? Yeah, okay, fine. But I find it easier to document my code when I'm writing this part of it. If I'm shooting from the hip and making it up as I go. All right? And I do a lot of that when I'm tinkering around. Okay? Professionally, well, you tend to need to know a lot more about where you're going before you start getting there. And you do tend to write the code that defines the objects before you start implementing them, all right? I'm just saying things work a little bit differently when it's just a little hobby Saturday afternoon project versus a professional project. And I spent a large number of years in high school and college and stuff like that tinkering around on my own and developed a lot of bad habits that are still with me today is my point with all that extra malarkey. Uh, the takeaway here is your doc belongs in the header file, okay, <laughs> because that's where it goes. All right. Now, Doxygen by default, all right, well, how do we connect it to this discussion? By default, Doxygen only, uh, where's the file listing here? Only is going to open up the header files for the doc. Why? Because it knows. It knows you're supposed to know what you're doing. And it should all be in the header files and not strewn all over the place. Okay? So what is, uh, all right, in this context, why am I bringing it up right now? Well, it turns out, as I just showed you, some of the RV32i stuff was commented in this file. Okay, <laughs> not in the header file. And uh, it doesn't show up in here because of that, all right? Okay, so this is the doxy file that was the default from the, you know, the, the, the template file that we generated with Doxygen itself. Now, I stowed an edited one up here so you don't have to watch me edit the entire thing. And let's move it back down here. Now, I have a different name. I have, this is the original one, and here's the one that I've modified. Now, let's go to a diff on these two files, and we can see the only thing, oops, that I changed. Here's the original one, and here's my hacked one. So I've only changed a few things. Starting with my project, I put that one, in, I changed it to RV32i. It only makes sense, right? And uh, we saw that one already. Now, there's all these things in there that says, do you always want to have this? Or you only want to have it if certain situations. So there's this the detailed section. And if we look at the comments inside the Doxygen file, it'll say, only provide detailed information about the subroutines if and only if they've been documented. And because I'm lazy and I didn't document every single last thing, I went ahead and made that set to yes. Even if Doxygen doesn't have anything to say about them, I believe it's useful to have it there. Okay. Uh, do you all uh, do you want to see anything that's been inherited as if it is a member of its own uh, class? Play around with these settings yourself and see what you think. This is a preference thing. Uh, what it really boils down to is if you got inheritance, 
Do you want to only see the stuff that's in the current class and then have to click on the parent to see the stuff that's in the parent and then go up to its parent to see more stuff? No, I hate that. What I want to do is if I have a class that's like a, you know, a great grandchild or something, I just want one page that shows me everything that it has plus all the inherited stuff. All right. So I can get my bearings out clicking all over the place. That's what this is all about. Do you want to see everything? Uh, including the undocumented stuff. Again, it's another one of these things. Uh, yes, I do. Do I want to see all the private members? Remember that size thingy? It's set to no by default. I set it to yes. What about all the static members of the object? By default, they say no. I say yes. Uh, do you want to see warnings if things are screwed? Yes, I do. This will help me fix my broken documentation. Now, you're going to have to read Doxygen about this in particular. If you set this and you say extract all at the same time, this has got a conflict inside Doxygen. I just point that out. In other words, if you say extract all, yes, it, 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 it won't do this for you. This is really nice because it'll let you know what you did wrong in your doc. So you got to kind of jockey these two things together in order to get a uh, an error report that says you forgot to document this. Okay, that's what this is for. Uh, input, input. I guess I put a space in here by mistake, so there's no real difference there. The tree view. This thing will add an index on the left side of the screen. Here's another project. You see, though, there's an index over here. This is this tree view thing. So I can always scroll up and down and look at different things, okay? This project doesn't have that. By setting this to yes, I have a nice index on the left. This predefined thing, well, let's go ahead and make this program, and you can see what's going on here. If you say make and you compile it and you have macros in here, actually I have two of them, uh, that have to do with, you know, how your program is compiled. And it could in some way affect your documentation. You might have to tell it to define those things, all right? This is because I actually have different modes for the simulator to run in. Is it disassembler? Is it a simulator? Does it have multiple cores, single core? All that other junk, all right? So when I created my documentation, I had to do this. Otherwise, it would not uh, give me all the right code and stuff like that. Do you want to hide things because they've been left undocumented? No, I want to see everything no matter what, okay? Now, we'll come back to the call graph and caller graph stuff in a minute. You see these pound signs over here? Those are commented out. We'll do this twice, one with and or first without, and then we'll add that. So let's look and see. If I run the doxygen command again with this thing instead of the default, right? So... Uh, I actually have this in my make file. Let's go in here and I can do the hacked version. Yeah. Okay. So this makes it easier for me to do this without typing it all in. So what did that actually do? If you type make minus, uh, what is it? Uh, uh N and, uh, run make that way. It'll say, I'm going to do this rather, but I'm not going to actually execute it. I would execute this if you didn't say don't do it. I think of this as not really, okay? So it says I'm going to run Doxygen with doc file, uh, doxyfile.hack. This is a comment, and it doesn't do that, right? So in the bottom of my make file, just so you know what I'm doing here, I move that comment marker back and forth depending on which one I want to use. So by typing make docs here, I just ran Doxygen uh, on this hacked file, right? So what did it do? It generated the HTML files here, the LaTeX files there, and uh, I should be able to see a whole new set of stuff in here. It may not work. I might have to start over. Oh, no, it did. Okay, good. So let's go back to the main page. Now we have this index on the left, all right? So the one thing is we know we got an index. The other thing, we changed the name of the project. Now when I navigate through here, I can find things. I have a nice index on the left. I like that, okay? Now remember I said document everything no matter what. If we look at RV32i now, look at all this stuff in here. That none of <laughs> the last time it had nothing. So this one is almost entirely undocumented. If there is doc, I put it in the wrong file, and Doxygen got upset about that. By me saying do everything no matter what, now I see everything, no matter what, including the fact that shift right logical is the comment or the brief description of this method in the CPP file, where it doesn't belong because I was lazy, and should have put it in the .h file, all right? So if you're lazy, you can kind of work your way around it because I'm not the only one who's that lazy, all right? So we have tons of stuff in here. What's this giant picture up here? What the heck is going on there? So one of the things that... Um, you can get 
is a collaboration diagram. What is that? Well, here's RV32i, and that's the class. These dashed lines, and there's an index down here. So it says legend. If you click on that, it'll say, oh, let's say you have some code that looks like this, and you build it like that. It, what it's done is it's created an object that has all these different relationships. So the blue one means this, the red one does that, the green one is this, and the purple one with the dashed lines. What does that mean? Uh, box the red border, blah, 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 blah. Purple dashed arrows use of a class is contained in or used by another class. So this is kind of neat. This is a diagram that says RV32i. If we looked at the source code of this, it has a bunch of members in it. These are member variables. It has a variable called pneumonic width and another one called instruction width inside here. And those are both static const expert int. It has a thing called PC and an M heart ID, which is an uint32. All right. Now, this is a pretty simple class. It has no real inheritance. And these are just a couple of uh, uh, member variables in there. But this is really nice. I don't have to go pouring through all the source code to figure out what's going on. Now, look and see what's going on here. RV32i has a thing called mem, which is an instance of this memory object. And the memory object contains an unsigned 32-bit integer and a pointer to an unsigned a, a, int 8. And we just saw that. Those are the private member variables of our memory object. All right, same thing here. He has a register file, and that thing has variable in it called reg, which is uh, a, an int 32t. It turns out that's an array of registers. But, you know, in this, no, in this simplified abstract notation, it shows you what's in here. What is this comprised of? Okay. This is not a subclass of memory. This thing has a thing called memory inside of it. Okay? All right. In fact, I think it's a pointer. Uh, if memory serves in this particular project, we scroll down here because I said, hey, show me everything, public and private. Remember that before, by default, it only shows me the public stuff. Why? Because if somebody wants to use this class, do they really need to know every little nuance of all the private things in there? No. They only want to know the public ones. But if I want to develop and, 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 and hack on this code, I want it to generate everything. So here's this memory thing, right? It defaults to zero, which is null, and it's appointed to the memory object. And here's the new doc for the memory object. Okay, now what do we got going on here? Remember before, it just had these functions over here with a little bit of detail down here. All right, this hasn't changed down here, but we got another one of these collaboration diagrams. Memory is comprised of 32-bit integer, Variable's called size and lock below. And then it has a pointer to an unsent A, which is memory. And now, this, of course, is a repeat of the uh, recursive expansion that you see up here in RV32i, right? Memory with these two guys, okay? So as this thing keeps going and going, this thing gets bigger and bigger, which I personally like because I want to know what's comprised of what, all right? So let's see what's going on in here. Uh, RV32i, I have no brief. Right? This is really annoying, right? You go on the internet and you see stuff like this. What the hell is that used for? I don't know. All right? The guy who documented that is a jerk. I'm a jerk. Sorry. Guilty as charged. At least this guy here has a little bit of doc. Okay? Um, so what's the value of doxygen? If you have no doc at all, well, you get these neat collaboration diagrams. Okay? Uh, and you get the index, you can find things. And as your programs get bigger and bigger and bigger, even if you write no doc at all, you get a lot of neat information about it. Okay, again, this is trivial. This is a trivial application, but we're getting a lot of neat stuff. Now, let's go back and do this other thing with the hacked file and turn on. This is like one of my favorite things uh, caller or something like that. Let's turn these back on. I default the, it's set to no. And I got these ready to go in here. Turn these on. What this is going to do is generate a graph that shows me who calls what subroutine and what subroutines are called by every single method, which I think is just fantastic. Okay. Now, again, you don't normally want this if you're going to just use the memory class. Well, look what we got now. If you scroll down into these detailed um, descriptions, and we look at check address, for example. Let me zoom out. Now, this is, a, this is a pretty big one, all right? Look at this picture here. What is this thing doing? 
Well, you see over here, this little gray box? That, that is the, uh, uh, okay. First of all, there's two pictures. All right, let's go to the top one first. Let's zoom in and scroll over. Uh, how do I get this thing to scroll over a little bit? Okay, there we go. It's just this one here that shows these three items. Let me get the other junk off the screen. What is this thing showing you? If you go to the left, it says here is the call graph for this function. The function is check address. It's the gray one. Right, it's a member of uh, the memory class, so its formal name is memory double call and check address. Well, what does this thing say? It says, "Look, check address calls hex, what I like to call hex ox thirty two, and hex ox thirty two indirectly will call hex thirty two." So, what I can do by looking at this is see the entire call graph. If there's something wrong with this function and I can't find it in the source code of this function, maybe I'm a program designer. Well, look down here. Maybe it called this and it died over there. Or maybe that's okay and it died in here. I can just get all this at a glance. Okay, really nice. Okay, there's, of course, there's other tools that can do things like this. But uh, this gives it to you along with everything else. I like this a lot. And then it says, here's the things that call this function. Right? So look and see what's going on. Here's the gray one. Yeah, these are completely separate graphs, and you could merge them together, I suppose, because once you get to here, it would continue over to there, all right? We have two separate ones because some of these, as you'll see in a minute, get really big. So when it says, here's the guys that call this function, you're going to start up here in main nine times out of ten. Main calls stuff. Right? It makes sense, right? If you're, who called this? Well, ultimately, it had to get called as a result of main running. It's a C app. So main calls any of these. And then inside here, it called this. And then this one in here calls this. And then this all makes sense, right? Check address. Well, what does set eight do? Without even thinking about it. Well, if you hover over it, it'll tell you the brief description, by the way. There's another place that the brief doc shows up, right? So this is a store an 8-bit value into the simulated memory. Well, set 8 calls check address. Why would it do that? So it doesn't accidentally set something to an illegal address. This is error checking in the code. In action, you see it happening here, right? So, of course, it's going to call that. Here's another one, get 8. Well, if anybody ever calls, hey, I want a value out of memory, it would be nice to check first, right? So this makes perfect sense. Well, what else does it tell us? Nothing else calls check address. In this particular class, the only way to call this is by here or here. This is wonderful. If you want to hack up this function, maybe you want to add a new feature to it or something, isn't it nice to make sure that you understand every context within which it might ultimately get called? I, I think the answer is yes. All right, so this is like really useful stuff. And, of course, I put some effort into documenting this particular uh, uh, class. And I didn't do any doc, really, to RV32i. And yet now let's look and see what's going on in here. Remember, we have all these extra things. Uh, let's look at the uh, source code for exec OWIEPC. All right, that's what this thing does, right? Let's look at the caller and the callie graphs of this thing. So OWIEPC, this subroutine here, calls all these subroutines. And then recursively, they go down here and call these other ones down there. So I can see what's going on. I didn't write any documentation for this at all. And I don't even need to look at the source code to see kind of how it works, what context it comes up in, and kind of what it's doing. Just by the names of these functions, right? Main calls either run or tick, uh, directly or indirectly. So this must have to do with running the simulation. It does. And DCEX, if I had a brief doc, it would help because it would pop up at this point. And it would tell you that this is stands for decode and execute an instruction. Okay? And the fact that it calls OWEPC means uh, that it, uh, it calls this if it decides to simulate the execution of this OWEPC instruction. Well, what does this thing do? Well, it has to read values of registers in order to simulate the execution of a machine instruction. That kind of makes sense. It calls something called render OWEPC. And if we look at what that code does, what this is doing is it's printing out a debug statement 
that shows you the instruction that the machine is executing, all right? If you actually uh, knew what this program was doing, that's what that thing I I is doing right there. It also might print the hex ox 32. These, these, these are formatting hexadecimal 32-bit values. The ox here means that it puts a zero X in front of it, right? Like in a C literal, okay? This thing prints a 32-bit value in hex without the leading 0x, all right? So if you actually look at the source code of this function right here, all you'd see is create a string with 0x followed by whatever this guy made, okay? That's how that thing actually is implemented. I just happen to know because I wrote it, right? Then there's a way to render a register. Now, on our Risk v machine, if you wanted to say, oh, I want to load register 5, well, when you print out register 5, what you're really doing is you need to say, like, x5. So there's a separate little utility function I have in there that just simply says render it the way it's supposed to be presented, okay? And then uh, our PC also needs to be able to set the value of a register, right? Now, if you know how machine language works, all this makes perfect sense. Read registers and then update them and set them if there's a result that's stored somewhere. These rendering routines and this thing here, all this has to do with printing for debugging output, all right? If there was no debugging at all, it would just be get register, do some math, and then set the result would be all you'd see in here, all right? But this is a simulator for debugging. We have these extra calls in there. Uh, what else is going on? Here's this B type instruction execution. All right, all these things. Again, I documented nothing, but I can see quite easily what this thing's made out of without munging through all the source. And I can see what happens with all these render functions and the tick and so on. What I would like to do is look at the tick routine. Where did that thing go? That's public or the run. Okay, because that's a big function. All right. Look at all the stuff going on in here. Now, remember, we were looking at the, uh, what were we looking at? Like uh, exec something or other, like exec Louis or Aoi PC. That's this guy right here. See, he's red right now. In this box, before we see it, we saw Aoi PC and it said, oh, it calls this register file get routine and, uh, and, and some other things, all right? And it's called by this DCX, which is called by tick, which is called by run, which is called by main, and so on, right? Well, if I say, show me run, now I'm asking to see run and all the subroutines that run calls, not just the things that were limited to this OWI PC. Now, notice these ones are red, the other ones are black. They're red because the let me zoom way out make this shrink down so you can get a bird's eye view on this thing the guy that uh, the little routine that generates these graphs has determined that if it put the entire set of all the dependencies for this aoi pc call in here there would be way too much visual noise it would be useless so what it does is it says look i'll show you what i can but if you really want to know what's going on with aoi pc click here and I'll expand what's in this red box, okay? Because what you're going to see in here, let's we just saw Aoi PC. I'll open that in a new window. Look at all the stuff it calls in here. It would have to fit all that in right here where it says Aoi PC. Look at exec or, okay? Let's open that one up. It too calls all the a lot of the same things, in fact, but a lot of junk, okay? If it had to put all that for OR, all that for OWI PC and so on, the problem would be every single one of these things are calling the render and the register file get, the register file set, and the hex ox 32s and all this other junk. Okay? If it showed all those arrows overlapping, this thing would just be a massive mess. It would be worthless. All right. So uh, the 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 documents, uh, the, the the thing that generates these these call graph images, my point is, uh, will uh, summarize uh, when necessary. OK. And then, of course, it says who calls run. Main is the only one who calls run. OK. There's another function down here called set ID. Oops. I zoom out and it changes scrolling and it's only called by main and so on. What do you suppose would happen if I clicked on main? and looked at the call graph for main. This is your entire program running. I everything. Notice no one calls main. There's no call er graph. There's only a call e graph. Okay? 
because being, no one calls it. it. It miraculously starts running when you run your program. So if we zoom way out here, here's a graph of my entire program. Now, there's some red boxes in here, right? I mean, obviously, all those exec routines, and, and you'll see there's render routines and stuff like that. They will get abbreviated, okay? Because this would otherwise be gigantic. Now, this level of abbreviation can also be tuned into oxygen. You can tell it, never abbreviate anything. And this will generate a map the size of Texas uh, if, if you want it to, all right? Now, uh, this is getting on very long at this point. Let's look at this other project. One last thing here. All right, so this is the source code in this directory. It's about 30,000 lines of code, a lot of objects, okay? So what's the difference between this and everything we've been looking at so far, all right? Well, let's go ahead and have a look-see. Look at all these classes in here. If we say, uh, what am I looking at here? The generic, let's, let's click on this thing. So let's say I want to see the documentation for this one class. It's called OMS ID Gen. If you really want to know what this does is it generates text strings that are used for ID numbers in stock trading orders and executions for messages clearly uh, written to talk to the Chicago Board Options Exchange, the Mercantile Exchange, a generic one that can talk to other exchanges, as well as the ICE Exchange. So this is like 20 years ago I wrote this thing. And yes, it's about 30,000 lines of code. Now, I forgot how this thing works. Last time I looked at it was probably 14 years ago. But I want to understand what's going on here, right? Well, what does this diagram represent? And this is the inheritance diagram. So what this tells me, and remember the RV32i, there was no inheritance. That's what we're looking at this one now. OMS ID Gen is the base class of all these other classes. This is the inheritance of that thing. Now, uh, OMS ID Gen, now let's look at the generic one. I'm not sure uh, we had to sign NDAs with these various companies. So I'm probably not supposed to show you how their ID generators work, but this is the generic one I wrote for myself for a simulated exchange and I own it so I can do anything I want with it. Okay. So what do we know about this one? Well, the generic one is a subclass of ID gen. That makes sense. Okay. And the generic one, what is it? It collaborates by way of inheritance here. Now I told Doxygen to create both of these types. All right. So this is not a very fancy object. All right. It's inherited from this and it collaborates with it by way of inheritance. That's all that really means. And we look at the documentation over here and the call graph, just like you saw before. This one's a little more sophisticated, all right? It makes sense. Uh, what this thing is used for is to, is, is to put ID numbers in stock orders, okay? And if you look and see what's going on here, it says, I want the next ID number to assign to an execution message. This guy over here is called, I want to get an ID number. I happen to know that this, this is an order. I, let's say I wanted to buy 100 shares of Cisco. Well, I have to say, I want to buy 100 shares of Cisco, and I'm going to call this specific, I'm going to give it a serial number, essentially, right? An ID number. I'm going to say, look, I'm going to call this order number 1234567. So when you come back to me, say, regarding 1234567, here's what's happening. Those are called status reports or executions and things like that, right? So you have uh, executions that have IDs, you have orders that have IDs, you have uh, cancellation requests and, and other such things. See where it says cancel uh, orders and trading things, the trade has been rejected. Maybe I misspelled the stock symbol or something like that. So there's a lot of different reasons to send messages. And this is the graph. There's our main calling down into this uh, call graph again. Uh, showing me how and when and in what context that function is called, all right? So uh, let's look at one that has a really nasty uh, inheritance. This one's really simple. An OMS link, for example, this thing re uh, defines how uh, things communicate between uh, my order management system, which is what this stands for. It's a, uh, it does what's called risk management. Is uh, What it does is it analyzes how much money I have and how much money I'm risking in the market at any given time and make sure that I don't exceed too much because if I make a mistake, I'd rather uh, not have to uh, go home and sleep in the street tonight if I spend too much money. And when I say I, I mean programs that I write. So for program trading, you have to protect yourself. Okay, so anyway, that's what this thing is. These are the things that represent the connections to the stock exchanges themselves. 
themselves that in turn use those ID numbers to put in messages that are routed back and forth. So what do we got here? OMS link is uh, how does it collaborate? So again, this inside of this object, there's a thing called a status report. The, the ID generator has, a, the, the, the fact that there's a P here, I use Hungarian notation, which means there's a pointer inside this object that points to this ID generator. This is which one to use, okay? And it also has a generic ID generator and so on, okay? It turns out this is a virtual base class, so it makes sense that it would have a relationship like this, okay? So uh, clearly the, the OMS link is, is intended to be as a base class for different kinds of links. We have XMQ messages, fixed messages, and fast. These are three different protocols that can be used to talk to stock exchanges and user programs and things like that. Fix is very generic, been around for 25 years. Let's look and see what a fixed link is. It's a subclass of OMS link. Okay, great. What is it doing? Well, <laughs> wow. <laughs> it has all these relationships, okay? I don't have to go back and look at 30,000 lines of code to figure out, is there a relationship between, uh, you know, the fixed link object and, you know, a status report and so on. That's what this is all about, okay? And as you can see, again, I didn't do a lot of documentation in here, but... I get all my call graphs, my caller graphs. I understand all these relationships. If I decide I want to modify this object right here, or that method, I should say, I can understand the impact it might have on all these other things. Absolutely critical if one line of code in error could cost you your entire life savings. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, <laughs> situational awareness can become very important yeah, more so depending on the kind of programs you're dealing with or whether or not you want a promotion or whether you've been asked to debug someone else's code that you have no idea how it functions, run it through Doxygen and turn on all these graphs, okay? And then you can see what the person created, all right? And you, without having to go through all your code, that's a huge gain. I love it. I've been going on about this. I guess uh, time to cut me off. But stick a fork in me, I'm done. You got the general gist on how to run this. Everything from here on in, uh, go back, read the Doxygen uh, uh, website for more and more details. There's all kinds of other stuff that this thing can do. These are just the basics, all right? So use it, love it, know it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye.